Common Assembly Commission. And I'll ask the clerk to read the motion. That this Assembly notes that members' salaries and pensions are determined by an independent body and that there should be no change to that arrangement, agrees that alternative provisions should be made for members' allowances and, in accordance with section 47 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, resolves that the Assembly Commission may determine the allowances payable to members of the Assembly, the date from which such allowances are payable, which may, which may be a date before or after the making of the determination or this resolution, and that the Commission shall publish any such determination. Point of order, Ms. Kelly. Um, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you. Um, and this is in no way a challenge uh, to your authority in accepting uh, the amendment that is before us uh, this morning, but the uh, Assembly Commission members received further advices last night which tell us that the amendment's intent cannot be implemented legally, and I would just ask for your view on the matter. Members should be clear, just because an amendment has been selected for debate, it does not necessarily mean that there is currently legal basis for its implementation. I am advised that the amendment in question purports to confer power on the Commission to issue guidance under section 47 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, and that this is not a power the Assembly has under section 47. Nevertheless, I am satisfied, having taken everything into consideration, that it is in order for me to use my discretion to select this amendment uh, for debate, and that these matters can be discussed in the course of debate, and therefore uh, the amendment stands. And they indeed can be explored further by all members who wish to contribute to the debate. And I now call Keith Buchanan to move the motion. Make to move. Thank you. <clears throat> the Business Committee has agreed to allocate one and a half hours for this debate, with ten minutes to move the motion, ten minutes to wind and for five minutes for all other speakers. One amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. Uh, and I invite you to open the debate. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, all parties represented on the Commission have engaged on this matter for a considerable time to reach a consensus position. The motion before the House today reflects that consensus position as was agreed by those on all of those five parties. Today's motion is, is being brought forward to enable the Assembly Commission to ensure that members can legitimately purchase basic items to help to, del to deliver service to our constituents, to ensure that an MLA's contact details can be promoted on the constituency office, and most notably to ensure that the terms and conditions of employment for the staff who work in our office are fair and reasonable. From discussions with a wide range of members from across the House, I know that there is considerable support on this point. We are talking about the things that every member in this place needs to deliver a constituent service that meets the needs of our constituents. It is the rent and rates for the offices, the electricity bills, the gas bills, the phone bills and the salaries of staff. For expenditure on constituency offices, a member cannot claim a single penny of what are termed allowances in the 1990 Act unless that member has already incurred that expenditure. In fact, the rent and rates bills and the salaries for support staff are paid directly to those parties be that a landlord for rent, employees or land and property services or for rates. The Assembly is absolutely not, and I repeat, is not being asked to confer a function on the Commission to determine the salaries or pensions payable to members or former members. That function should, of course, fall to an entirely independent body. The Commission intends to bring forward a bill subject to the will of the Assembly that will change the remit and scope of the Independent Financial Review Panel to focus solely on members' salaries and pensions, with a possible change to the name of the body to reflect its revised responsibilities. Members will know that the scrutiny of claims is rigorous and comprehensive. That will not change. I know that every member and every party agrees that all our expenditure must, and I repeat, must be made according to the rules that are put in place. It is, it is reasonable for people inside and outside this House to ask why this motion has been brought to the Assembly at this time. Members will be aware that the Assembly established the Independent Financial Review Panel back in 2011 
While the panel made significant improvements to the overall system, it is felt that the rules set out in the determination in March 2016 failed to grasp the realities that members face as we try to deliver services to constituents. The determination certainly did not provide our employees with fair and reasonable terms and conditions of employment for the difficult work that they undertake. In 2015, even before the most recent determination was issued by the panel, the Commission began to review a range of options for the reform of the system of providing financial support for members. It is, this, it is the Commission's position, achieved through consensus from all five parties, that the support that can be made available to members, especially to operate a constituency service, can best be delivered from within this building. Issues that have been raised by members from all sides of the House, but the changes to the terms and conditions of employment for support staff that members were required to adopt is probably the issue that has caused the most concern for members as responsible employers. The last determination dramatically reduced sick and maternity pay for employees. Indeed, even for those who at that time were off work due to illness and maternity, a high unusual practice. Annual leave for employees was also reduced for those employees to the minimum statutory level. These terms have to be adopted by members if staff salaries are to be recovered and are considerably less than the terms offered by most public and private sector employees. Other issues included the prohibition on letting constituents knowing, know our telephone number and email address on our office signage. While this might be a small thing, I have yet to hear any rational explanation why this is the case or why it is desirable to have this prohibition in place. The formula for assessing the level of rates for an office that can be paid in any year. Members may wish to know that almost one-sixth of all members in this House had to personally pay a part of the rates bill for their office in the 2019-2020 financial year. And members will also be aware of the bar on operating a surgery somewhere else in the constituency, maybe by renting a room or a hall once per week or once per month. Again, the purpose of that prohibition is yet unclear. Indeed, the current determinations provision if untouched, will prevent members from recovering the cost of any expenditure incurred with a supplier who is resident in the United Kingdom once the implementation period for the UK's exit from the UK ends. When we look at the other legislators across the British Isles, there are a variety of systems in place to assess the types of expenditure and level of expenditure that elected members can recover. In Dublin, TD's allowances are determined by statutory instrument made by the Minister of Finance at Westminster MP's allowances are set by the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority. In Wales, they are set by the Independent Remuneration Board, and in Scotland, allowances for MSPs are set by the equivalent of the Assembly Commission. There is no single mechanism for determining the allowances paid to elected members. Should the Assembly resolve today to confer the function of determining the allowances payable to members on the Commission, the Commission would bring forward and publish a new determination to deal with the aforementioned problems. Any such determination will continue to apply best practice and ensure value for money for the public purse. Let us be clear, this is the only mechanism presently available to create a new determination. If this motion is not carried, the current determination will remain in place until a successor panel is appointed and new determination is made. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to briefly address the amendment made in the name of Mr Allister. Members may wish to note that the only functions that can be conferred on the Commission by the Assembly under Section 47 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 Act are to determine the, the salaries and or allowances that are payable to members. The Assembly cannot confer a function on the Section 47 of the 1988 Act for the Commission to direct the panel, indeed to Section 3 of the 2011 Act that facilitated the formation of the panel actually codifies the independence of the panel. In short, the Commission has no power to direct the panel. When considering this matter, this, the Commission did identify a possible scenario where the 2011 Act could be amended to require the panel to align the terms and conditions of members' support staff to a reasonable comparator. While that might resolve the issues relating to terms and conditions of employment for member staff, it will not resolve any of the other issues that members and parties have raised with the 2016 determination. The motion today is much clearer, and the Commission's view offers the most effective approach to determining the allowances that should be payable to members. When allied to the robust and effective scrutiny of all claims that is already in place and the Commission's ability to direct more quickly to, an ex to external circumstances and the changing needs of members than an external body, the Commission is firmly of the view that the motion sets out the best way forward. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, this motion is about setting reasonable and fair levels of financial support for offices and conditions of employment for constituency staff in a way that fully understands the challenges that members face each and every day. All parties represented on the Commission 
have engaged in this matter for a considerable time to reach a consensus position. The motion before the House today reflects that consensus position. Based on the views of all parties represented in the Commission, I commend the motion to the House. I call Jim Ellis to move the amendment. Uh, to, to formally move the amendment. Yes, uh, I move the amendment. Thank you. You will have ten minutes to propose the amendment and a further five minutes to wind. All other speakers will continue to have five minutes. And I invite you to open the debate on the amendment. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Those bringing forward this motion must have very short memories. I don't think the public have. The public well remember that when the system that is proposed in this motion was in operation, namely that MLAs controlled through the Commission their own expenses, it was abused and the product was scandal. 2010-11, in the face of a tide of public outrage, the Assembly passed the Act in 2011, and in doing that, recognised that it was untenable for the Assembly to be members to be in control either of their own salary, pensions, or their allowances. And today, we are asked to retreat from that and recreate the circumstances which give rise to such scandalous behaviour as Sinn Féin members pouring £700,000 of their expenses, unknown at this claim by some of their MLAs, into a body called Research Services Ireland Limited, headed up by Sinn Féin's finance director. When BBC Spotlight did a programme, they could find no website for Research Services Ireland, they could find no phone number, they could find not even one sheet of paper of research ever produced. It was a scam. It was a rip-off of public money. Michelle O'Neill, the current Deputy First Minister, paid £18,000 of rent to a so-called cultural society for an office in Gulladuff, the South Derry Cultural and Heritage Society. One of the six trustees of that hall for which the money was paid let the cat out of the bag. He said, a Mr. Michael McGonagall, he claimed Sinn Féin had raised the money to buy the building 30 years ago. And here was a Sinn Féin MLA, now the Deputy First Minister, paying £18,000 a year colossal rent to the supposed cultural society. Mr. McMonagall went on to say he'd never heard of the South Derry Cultural and Heritage Society and said as a trustee he'd never received any rent for the use of the building. Mr. Deputy Speaker, those are facts as established. We had the Church Street office in Balmamina, the scandal of £50,000 in one year, claimed by a father and son member of this assembly to go into an office of whom the first director was, I know of him, fame, Seymour Sweeney, replaced as sole director by Ian Paisley Jr.'s father in law, and then replaced by a DUP councillor who said, when asked about the matter by the Belfast Telegraph, I haven't a clue. I don't know flip all about it. I know nothing about it. I'm only the landlord. I ever he later told BBC Spotlight, the sole beneficiary of the rent is the bank. 
What does that mean? That means rent for expenses was being used to pay off a mortgage to create a party asset. It is Sinn Féin MLA who couldn't drive, who apparently was making claim for £5,000 mileage allowance, said he'd never signed the form. Someone else had done it for him with £9,000 claimed for oil in the former Speaker's constituency office, which wasn't used there, with an MLA who claimed £7,000 for electrical equipment to create a, a paper-free office, iPads, laptops, computers, and then went on to claim £8,200 in stamps for his paperless office. What a farce! And it's such circumstances that we're being invited to return to. Now, I know the panel has been guilty of some of the most irrational decisions, like not being able to put your phone number in your office signage. It was me that took them, tried to take them to the ombudsman and that. Not being allowed to have more than one office. I suffered from that. I know they made some ridiculous decisions and have been most bumptious in trying to defend them. But the principle here is, should we as MLAs be setting our own salary? No. Should we be setting our own allowances? No. So why do we want to do it, particularly in circumstances where the body to which we give it, we want to give these powers, in the past did nothing about the £700,000 to research services, did nothing about the Babamina Church Street office, did nothing about the fictitious claims to cultural societies, swept it all under the carpet. And that's the circumstance we want to recreate. I respectfully suggest to this House we're headed very much in the wrong direction. And that's why I say we need to leave the quantum, the amount of the expenses, with the independent panel, but we need to take powers, enhance powers, to give guidance to that panel when they make irrational, unjustifiable, absurd decisions. I heard the proposer of this motion saying there's no legal power. Has he never read section 2.4 of the 2011 Act? It says, the panel may consider any other matter which is relevant to the discharge of its functions, either on its own initiative or at the written request of the Commission. So the Commission already has the power to write to the panel and say, you made a decision about not being able to put your phone number on your office signage. Would you please reconsider it for the following reasons? A written request. You've made a decision which is prejudicial to our maternity leave rights, our paternity rights, sickness rights of our staff. Would you please look afresh at it? The power's there. Why has it not been exercised? Indeed, why has the panel never been reappointed? Why is it that a panel that ran out of steam and ran out of office in 2016 has never been replaced? Were some people wanting this situation to fester so that they then could reach this point of saying, we have to do something about it? And the member who proposed this left me unclear what he intends. He said, on the one hand, the Assembly Commission will bring forward a bill to change the range and the scope of the body, the panel. And then towards the end, he said, the Commission will bring forward a new determination. Which is it? Are you just going to wipe out the panel, override them by a determination on foot of our mere resolution of this House? There is legislation. Are you going to change the legislation 
to do the very things that you would, said you wouldn't do a few years ago. I think we need some clarity. Are you thinking that by mere determination you can override the decisions made under the 2011 Act, or are you going to change the 2011 Act? If you want to do something, you have to change the, draws remarks to the close? 2011 Act. And when you change it, you can do exactly what's proposed in this amendment, and thereby maintain the sanctity of separation between members and alliances. But the member's the time is up. To make sure they stay on the rails at every turn. The member's time is up. I call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I uh, thank the House for the opportunity to briefly contribute to this debate, an important debate. Um, from the outset, the public, uh, as we've heard today already, are rightly annoyed about the prospect uh, of any increases to expenditure, but uh, there needs to be clarification put into the public domain as to what this is about. It's not about members' pay, and we cannot blame the public for being angry, especially after being locked out of these institutions uh, against certainly against our will for the last uh, number of years. This motion isn't about MLA's pay, however. There is no change to members' pay, and nor should there be. Members' pay will still be independently determined, uh, and that should always be the case. The SDLP would not support it if that was the case. This motion is uh, about how we treat members of staff, how we deal with complex problems, and offer a service to the public every day. There, in the current determination, was a real lack of common sense, and I think that was rightly touched on by Mr. Allister in his contributions in relation to even around signage, phone numbers, a very small crest on a door, very simple things uh, that were finable under the current determination. Even a printer breaking down couldn't be repaired locally. You had to send for someone to come from Belfast at a cost to the public purse that made no sense whatsoever. And when you tried to have those discussions, uh, you were shot down and said, it's in the determination. It made things very, very frustrating for a lot of Assembly members to continue in their duties. Many of us in this chamber proudly support workers' rights and the advancement of these rights. And each and every day I hear members of this House say about the importance uh, of protecting workers' rights. Well, we need to ensure, in order for the public to have confidence, that we practice what we preach and we are in a situation where our staff are being failed uh, because their rights are not being protected in the current determination. And whilst I understand and appreciate the reasons for the determination, given the previous abuses of some in relation to the expenses of MLAs, it is vitally important that we, as employers and as MLAs, protect the rights of our staff. Mr. Speaker, I am not proud that we give our staff the minimum legal amount of sick and maternity pay. I am not proud that annual leave is at the minimum statutory level. I am not proud that under the current rules of the determination, there are staff in MLA offices who could be earning less than the living wage and struggling. I know full well that we are living in very tough times and that every penny of public spend needs to be accounted for. But I stand here today for my staff and the hard-working staff of many other Assembly members in offices who deserve fair ter terms and pay conditions. My office could not run without my staff working more hours than they are paid for. And the many volunteers who have helped and assisted me in my duties as a public representative on a daily basis, they are making an invaluable difference to the communities that I serve, that I am elected to serve, and all I want for them is fairness. We are not seeking a dilution of scrutiny or accountability. The opposite is true. These measures will demand enhanced scrutiny of every penny spent in this place, and my party is committed to a robust transparency measures to ensure there is no return to the abuse of public money, as clearly outlined very articulately by Mr Allister in relation to Research Services Ireland. And I in this House have mentioned that on many occasions in previous contributions. The SDLP will be making that position clear and at, uh, and at the Assembly Commission as well. Now more than ever, constituency offices are needed to help the many vulnerable people contacting us each, each and every week, the many businesses struggling to make ends meet, and to support those seeking to improve our communities. The motion 
It's about MLAs deciding what we want to be responsible for the well-being of our staff and for running an effective and efficient office that delivers for people. That's vitally important to support our communities at this time. Not an easy debate, but there are issues with the determination, Mr Deputy Speaker, that need to be addressed. Our staff deserve fairness. We can't go out into the public domain uh, and uh, stand up for the rights of workers if we're not going to practice what we preach ourselves. Uh, and that is the reason we will be supporting the change and the motion. I call Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's a nervousness about this motion. Uh, there's a nervousness in this House. I sense it. Uh, I think there's a nervousness uh, in wider society uh, about this motion. And we have to always be mindful is that as an assembly, we must have the confidence of our society. And if we do not have that confidence, then we are always going to fail. What we had in the IFRP determination felt flawed. It felt irrational. It felt like we were punishing all MLAs because of the abuses of some. It felt like a collective punishment meted out on every single one of us. I think Mr Alistair has, has raised a, a compelling argument about the abuses of the system as it stood now. And, and that resonates within the society that we represent. And we must be mindful of that. And, and we have looked at the absolutely ludicrous position where we can't put our telephone number on a signage. So for the last three months when your office has been closed and the shutters have been down, um, nobody has seen your phone number to go and give you, give you a call. It, it, that's the irrational piece uh, of all of this. This issue has been debated by the Assembly Commission uh, at length and it is right to bring this before this Assembly for debate and for people to give their arguments and for people to make decisions based on those arguments and to try and explore if there are other ways of achieving the same thing from either the motion or the amendment. Personally, I don't need any extra expenses. My office doesn't need any extra expenses. I cut my cloth to meet what I have, as every other business does. And I've been working quite happily since I became an MLA in 2016. But I do have a real concern about the pay and the conditions of my staff. Because they do not have the right pay and conditions. Their pay is scandalous. And they're dealing with civil servants in this house who get paid nearly twice as much as they do. The Ulster Unionist Party Chief Whip in the Commission wanted to adopt an IPSA model for doing this, but that wasn't deemed cost effective. But at least people were exploring other ways of doing this, and I know other parties did similar. In fact, I think all parties did similar before they come up uh, with this motion. Um, so it's right that this motion is before us, and it's right that we do debate this motion and we put our points ac across. But let's not just throw out Mr. Allister's amendment because it doesn't match what we've gone through and what we've talked about. Let's use it as the ability to talk and think and maybe push back and postpone what we're trying to do here in order to have that confidence, transparency and accountability that we have been lacking for quite some time. I said it before, um, Mr Allister brings forward a compelling argument and nothing stops us creating a new panel and nothing stops us from having a new determination. I'm not saying we set aside the IFRP determination, but it certainly needs to be amendable. My nervousness as an MLA, my party's nervousness about this motion now is that in the months and the years to come, it will be abused we will forget the lessons that we learned in the past and we will lose that confidence. And we will lose that confidence individually, collectively, as a house. So when I go back to where I started and I said that it's right to debate in this chamber and give your points of view across, no matter how popular or unpopular they are, we need to do that. 
And if we have to change direction, we have to change direction. I believe Mr Allister's amendment gives us the ability to change direction. I think it gives us the ability to look at this in the long term. I think it gives us the ability to create a new panel, and that new panel can create a new determination. Therefore, I and my party will be um, supporting the amendment. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, interesting issues have been raised by others who have spoken before me. Um, I attended a commission meeting where the debate was had on this matter. And the debate, as Alliance has always and has maintained the whole time through, we would have preferred an independent body to look at all aspects of payments that come towards NAMLA. So salaries, pensions and allowances. Even though the allowances don't go into our pockets, which some people don't seem to understand, it is to pay our staff and to pay rent. But we were voted down that day. And that day, the collegiate approach was the motion that is before us. I will. Can the member not recall that there was no such vote taken? I mean, this is a narrative that is absolutely shameful. Shameful on the Alliance Party. There was no such vote taken. Can you confirm that? The member is an extra minute. Thank you very much. Uh, well, actually, the day that I was there, there was a call around the room, and each one of the parties was to say yes or no whether or not they would support having an independent body like Westminster. And Alliance was the only one who supported that. Everybody else decided that there needed to be changes made. We have in front of us today a motion. A motion that the Alliance Party, to be honest, on a collegiate approach, could support but we will take any opportunity that there is to support an independent body to look over all of the money that comes towards MLAs. Today is the International Day of Parliamentarism. Today, on this day, the United Nations Assembly Resolution says that the International Day of Parliamentarism should be celebrating um, giving confidence to the public. And they, they said in their resolution about the need for transparency. We wouldn't give our staff the power to dictate their own salaries, but we're giving ourselves that power. We're saying we're going to set our salaries for our staff. Now, we're the employers, but it's public money that we're using, and I think that we, they do need to be refer, reviewed. The, the treatment of the staff within MLA offices by the existing determination is deplorable and wouldn't be put up within any other place. But I do believe an independent body, like there is in Westminster, would be appropriate. We weren't successful in the Commission, and that's why we say today the motion we could have gone with, but there's an opportunity for the amendment here. I believe that the amendment gives us the opportunity to look at an independent body, to bring into scope someone else that will help to scrutinise and set standards for payments towards MLAs. I will give way. I appreciate the member giving way. The member has just articulated a view that she wants an independent panel to deal with these things um, because of the failures of the previous independent panel, and she acknowledges all of those failures. So if the previous panel didn't treat our staff fairly, what confidence then can MLAs have that a new panel would treat our staff fairly? Thank you very much. And the member actually is going to help me to confirm for you why it's so important. The previous panel was not independent. The previous panel was brought forward through a recruitment process that determined people who could not be on the panel, but not people who should have been on the panel. Where was the expertise in accountancy? Where was the expertise on HR? Where was the expertise about HMRC? It wasn't there. We have the opportunity now to have an independent body like the one that's used in Westminster that will include all that type of professional qualifications that we need to ensure fairness for our staff and for the public. If you let me just carry on, I'll bring you in a moment. The recruitment of the panel would be key. We can no longer allow our staff to be treated like second-class citizens because people wanted to get at MLAs. We need people with business management. We need people with HMRC. And I have to say, for the last period of time, while the IFRP panel has not been in place, the Commission has handed over the management of the determination to staff in this place, which has been very unfair because that determination has been unpleasant to deal with. And those staff have had to deal with all of us MLAs in that. So what I would say is that we should be looking at this amendment. We should be considering alternatives. We should be looking at transparency, and we should be above and beyond. I'll let the member come in. 
appreciate the member giving way again. Um, she's indicated that the, another independent panel should have the professional expertise to look at this issue. Is she saying that the previous chairman of the Belfast Health Trust and assistant chief constable didn't have the requisite qualifications to consider all of those areas around HR issues, financial accountability, given what was on their CV? Um, I wasn't here when that panel was chosen, but I can only go by what happened whenever that panel brought forward their determination, whenever HMRC had to come to this place and say that the way that they were paying out um, expenses to MLAs was wrong and there was a recruitment of costs back from all MLAs, otherwise this place was going to face a fantastic tax bill. So there was something going wrong there. Absolutely. What I'm saying is on behalf of the Alliance Party, when we have the opportunity to go for an independent body, we will take that. We respect the collegiate approach of the Commission, but I'm sure everybody can respect the fact that as a party, we have been pushing for this. We put it in our written submission. We said it at the Commission meetings. We weren't given the opportunity to take that forward. We would be happy enough to vote for the motion as it currently stands, but when there's the opportunity for an amendment for an independent body, we will take that. Thank you. And I call Jim Wells. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I contribute on this debate as one who has been around this building a very, very long time. I have served on the Assembly Commission for 14 years. I have been an Assembly Member's Pension Scheme Trustee for 16 years. I have served on the Audit Committee and I've been a member of this House for 26 years. Indeed, there are people in this room who weren't even born when I was first uh, elected to this Assembly. Therefore, I speak with some experience. And we did, in our wisdom, appoint an independent review panel. And there were two individuals on that panel who had absolutely no time for public representatives and did it show in their determination. And where they lost my respect in totality, was when they clearly had botched the report and made major errors, they didn't turn round and admit that. They tried to defend the indefensible. And we had the situation where a very experienced and respected member of this assembly was fined almost £10,000 out of his pension because he had the temerity to put his phone number on his sign. Now, how dare we put our phone number on our signs that our constituents, particularly during lockdown, can come and find out how to contact us. Would there be some major democratic deficit? Would there be some tragedy occur if our constituents could find out our phone numbers? But what did the two spokes gentlemen do when they were asked about this mistake? They defended it when they knew it was wrong. Then they told us we could not have our email address on our office signs, because obviously that would bring democracy crashing around our, our, our ankles. Their argument was that the email address could read something like Jim Wells, the most wonderful MLA since time began, dot com. And they said that could be abused. Well, why could they not have accepted that if we all had our assembly.gov.uk email address, that would have avoided that? But again, they defended the indefensible. We had a situation in North Down where a young lady who went off on maternity leave was forced to return as a result of the, of the determination because of the change in the regulations, which are much less favourable to both fathers and mothers. And it goes on and on. Indeed, there's a case at the moment where an MLS is facing a £20,000 fine for something so minor that most employers would have shrugged their shoulders and forgot it, forgotten about it. We have so many issues where they've got it wrong. So therefore, unlike the Honourable Member for North Antrim, I have no confidence whatsoever that another panel can deal with this situation. We are not, and I repeat not, and I hope the public get this, and I hope the BBC gets it, because the reporting of this has been far from, in my opinion, accurate. We are not asking for a pay rise, and shouldn't. We are not asking for a change in our pensions. What we are asking for is a fundamental fair treatment of our staff, none of whom have had a pay rise for five years, who have had their pensions slashed and who have had their basic rights undermined, and there's nothing that we can do about it. And that's the difficulty. Now, Mr Alistair was very eloquent today, I have to say that. And he raised some points. He raised the appalling abuses of the past, and I agree with them. But remember, there's a fundamental difference between now and 2011. Every penny that we spend in our office cost allowance will be published and scrutinised uh, by the press. 
A few years ago, a local newspaper contacted me and said, Mr. Wales, how can you justify spending £1.50 a week on a local newspaper? I said, that is your newspaper. He said, that's a very good use of taxpayers' money. The point is that that's how, how minute detail there is at the moment. Secondly, we have learnt our lessons. There's no problem, for instance, with the Commission setting a limit on the amount of rent that can be paid. But we've got the obscenity, obscenity at the moment whereby MLAs have to forcibly go, go to their landlords and plead with them to increase their rents so they can recoup the rates that are payable, because that is tied to the level of rents. We have the obscenity where members cannot share offices because of the punitive controls that are placed upon them for, for doing so. They have got it completely wrong. The member makes a valid point on the sharing of offices. In my constituency, I, my colleague, share with the Member of Parliament, and yet it would be to the detriment of the taxpayer for I and my colleague in this House to open up our own office where you can access greater amounts of taxpayers' money. We're saving the taxpayer money by sharing, but then penalised for it through this determination. The Member's an extra minute. Yes, thank you for the extra minute. Clearly, the, the panel, when they determined that, got it wrong. But have they ever had the honesty to go and talk back or the Nolan Show, etc., and actually admit they got it wrong. And that's where I have lost all respect for that determination. So therefore, what we are doing here is not feathering our own nest. It's looking after the people who have had to deal with the abuse, have had to deal with irate members of the constituency coming in uh, to complain, and who, many of whom have drifted off and have said, if this is how we're going to be treated by the legislator of Northern Ireland, we are no longer interested in working for you. And those are the people that count, and I believe that we as MLAs need to stand by them, even if it's unpopular with the public. And I call Gary Middleton. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, and uh, I come on the back and, and support everything that my colleague, uh, Mr Jim Wells, has said. He has very clearly articulated uh, some of the many issues that all members of this chamber will, will agree with. And, and you know, we today stand with our staff, who have put in a huge amount of hours, a huge amount of effort for very little uh, thanks. Uh, but what we do need to do is look at uh, those determinations. And I have to say, I am bewildered, but I suppose at the same time not overly surprised about the reactions of some of the members in this House. You know, Mr Butler has signed this motion. Mr Blair has signed this motion. Yet they obviously do not speak to their party colleagues. There's, a, there's a clearly a communication issue. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think just to make it clear, whenever I was given my speech from the Alliance Party, we said that we worked on a collegiate approach within the Commission, but when there was an opportunity after the Commission had put forward its motion for an amendment, we chose to back the amendment. So there's no issue with Mr Blair. Members, the next minute. Well, look, I, thank for that, I thank you for that intervention, but I think it is far from clear in terms of the Alliance Party's position because there's one position behind closed doors and there's another one publicly, and unfortunately that hasn't been uh, the case in just this issue, but that's a matter for the Alliance Party and the public will judge for themselves, and indeed the members of the staff within our Assembly offices will judge for themselves. Uh, the people of Northern Ireland have the right to a clear and uh, reasonable explanation of exactly what has been proposed today. We remain firmly of the view that MLA should have no role in setting their salary or indeed their pensions. That must continue to be set independently and nobody uh, for one sec second is questioning the fact that that is done independently. However, we also acknowledge that striving for the highest standards in public office means enabling the highest quality of representation. So that's why I entered politics, to get results from my constituents to make a lasting difference. It is, however, a matter of regret that the use of an independent body to decide the office and the staff allowances has hindered rather than helped this cause. Not our cause per se, but the cause of those who we collectively represent. Local communities deserve constituency services that are flexible and responsible to their needs. They are also entitled to have appropriately skilled staff working on their behalf. Sadly, in many circumstances, the, the uh, current circumstances in the current system do not allow for this. As a consequence, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I thank the member for giving way. Does the member agree with me that there are two fundamental principles that people never seem to bear in mind or of which they seldom take account? One is 
that the, the two full-time equivalents, or the 74 working hours per week, puts members in situations where they have zero flexibility with staff, and that often results in times of sickness or leave, in lone working, where, mem where our members of staff, often female, are left in vulnerable positions. And secondly, does the member agree with me that it is deeply unfair that a very experienced member of staff who happens to move to work for another member has to automatically go back to the bottom of their scale? I, I completely agree with the member, and these are disgraceful situations that wouldn't be tolerated uh, anywhere else. And, and again, the House is absolutely unanimous in these issues, but when it comes to it, they're unwilling to deal with it. Uh, and I think that's deeply regrettable, given the fact that all parties have supported the motion. Uh, it's an unacceptable position, and we do need to rectify that position. The reality is that different constituencies across this country have different needs. There needs uh, that, that singular approach, approach that was uh, decided independently cannot appreciate or address those issues. Mr. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, that is why we support the changes that is put forward in this motion. We do not believe the measures set out in the selected amendment would have the necessary impact or influence in addressing core concerns around the level of service afforded to the public. Indeed, we all had the opportunity to write to the Commission. We all had the opportunity to raise the concerns. But that alone clearly had no impact on the independent panel. The independent panel in the past have met with MLAs. They knew the issues. But like Mr. Wells has clearly articulated, they did not take those views on to, uh, into concern. So obviously setting up a new independent panel uh, is not the way forward because I think as some members are saying, set up an independent panel hoping that we'll get the right result for our staff. But clearly that hasn't uh, worked out well in the past. I do want to emphasise the fact that MLAs will not receive... A yeah, go ahead. I think it's also important that we discuss staff safety. Uh, throughout the last mandate, there has been a series of incidents in MLA's offices where staff have not felt safe. Uh, and certainly in my own office in Oma, uh, that happened to one of my members of staff who were on her own uh, because we could not have anyone to cover the person that was off, and they suffered uh, a threat that day. So surely there needs to be some uh, uh, allowance for uh, staff safety as well. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank the member. I completely agree. Uh, staff safety is something that we've had to deal with personally in our own office on many occasions. And it is frightening and it is scary. And I think we owe it to our staff, our very hard-working staff, who are on the front line, uh, who have been right throughout this COVID-19 crisis. I think that they deserve the respect. And this is not about MLAs. This is about our staff and showing support and appreciation for them. So I would urge everybody to support this motion and, and do what closed. you've agreed to uh, and get behind it. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Deputy Speaker, I was elected in 2016 after this financial review had happened, after the stories of the expenses scandals had broken. Um, and where we had lost so much faith and trust within the public uh, arena. Um, and there can be no doubt, of course, that there are problems with the independent financial review determination um, and how we can access a, and use our office cost expenditure. Um, and they are much bigger than putting a phone number on a sign. Um, and I think that Ms Bunting was absolutely right when she pointed out the, the restrictions of flexibility that we can allow our staff, the maximum working hours, the setting of salaries, um, and if there's any uh, changes that they go back to the bottom or have to even reapply on the open competition for their own jobs. There are many, many problems um, with this. But again, we have to remember why we are here. Um, and even issues of setting a cap on rent, office cost rents, and that applies for everyone equally right across Northern Ireland. Um, you know, it, it, it's a very different rate and rent setting in, in Straban High Street, for example, than it is in South Belfast, but yet that's not taken into consideration either. I get this, our staff are treated differently and every single staff contract I have signed since being elected, I have handed it back to the staff um, with the recommendation that if if they are not already, that they join a trade union and that they challenge me on it. To the date, they've all been so nice that they haven't done that, but I still recommend that they do. Certainly. Does the member agree with me that we're also in a situation where not only are the terms and conditions 
infinitely better within their own civil service, but they're infinitely better within this assembly for assembly staff, and they're actually party staff and our local MLA staff are, have actually the worst terms and conditions of everybody who works in this sector. The members, an extra minute. Thank you. And I think that these issues have been very well made in this chamber. Um, but what I'm hearing is um, an awful lot about having no trust and no faith in an ind independent financial review panel, because the only one that we've had to date got it so wrong. Sometimes this house gets it wrong. Sometimes people in this house get it wrong. But yet what we have is always another chance to get it right. And that should never stop us from ever trying to keep getting it right. So that we have had no independent financial review panel since June 2016. They haven't existed. So what's going on in that process? Why have we been left all these years with no one there? We really, really, really need to keep public confidence and public trust in us because I don't think that we have done an awful lot to get over the absolute scandal um, that was back in 2015 and 16. We need our independence and we need to continue to keep building trust and I believe that we can do both. So the Green Party will be supporting this motion as amended today. I call Jerry Carl. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's worth remembering the consternation that the MPs expense this scandal on their local version caused uh, across communities here a few years ago. People were outraged in the middle of economic austerity where they were told they had to uh, tighten their belt, that MLAs, or some of them at least, were involved in unsavoury financial practice, to put it nicely. Never again should we tolerate a system in which people can funnel extremely large sums of public money into research companies that didn't do any research, if they even existed in any real sense at all, or questionable heating bills came in multiple times for offices and much, much more, as we have already heard. I would hazard a guess, Mr Deputy Speaker, that if somebody was on benefits and they were accused of this kind of activity, they would probably be in jail now or face uh, a small claims court um, case. But the same didn't happen to MLAs or party reps. And this motion states that uh, alternative provision should be made, but doesn't state clearly what that is or what that should be. And we're left to believe that it will simply be the Assembly Commission itself uh, deciding. Again, are we to have blind faith that a fair and transparent system will be set up if we just take the word uh, of the bigger parties on this issue? And where is the accountability with this proposed alternative system? New decade, new approach, Mr Deputy Speaker states, and I quote, the parties have therefore agreed to an ambitious package of measures to strengthen transparency and governance arrangements in the Assembly and Executive in line with international best practice. Not here, not with this proposal. And I'm not sure if this proposal uh, that we're actually discussing today was agreed uh, as part of new decade, new approach, but we can safely say that it certainly doesn't represent uh, a transparent or the best practice arrangement, and many people will be left scratching their heads uh, with that assertion. I think it falls well short of bre best practice to have a situation, it seems, where MLAs themselves can decide constituency expenses for themselves uh, and fellow uh, MLAs. Many would take the view uh, that this, makes, uh, uh, um, this doesn't appear to be an open system and one that could be exploited um, or, um, towards uh, MLAs. It's worth mentioning, um, Mr De Deputy Speaker, that many workers would welcome the opportunity uh, to set their own expenses in relation to the office costs and uh, support staff, but of course cannot. Why should there be a different arrangement for MLAs? And the last survey, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, showed that at least 15 MLAs employ family members in different roles relating to constituency work uh, and research uh, activities. Can we honestly say that there will be no conflict of interests in MLAs setting the allowances and wages, if not of their own? Than their party colleagues' relatives. How can we accurately and truly declare this to be an independent, transparent, or fair system? 
Again, I'm sure most workers, the health workers who had to go on strike recently uh, for fair pay, would love to have family members set their own wages, conditions, allowances, and, and so on and so forth. And to emphasise, Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe all workers deserve a fair wage. I'm open to a fair system uh, that treats office staff and other staff who work in the political sphere in a fair and equal way, but this proposed system does not do that. And it's worth remembering that we look into uh, economic uh, abyss, with many people uh, losing their jobs, unfortunately, and we'll have a situation where it's, it's one rule for, for people, uh, MLA, setting their own, their own expenses uh, and allowances, while people uh, will lose their jobs and go uh, on uh, to, to the double queue. Mr Speaker, we still don't know the clear political rationale for this proposal. Presumably, there have been discussions about the current level of expenses on the Exam Assembly Commission. Can anyone clarify if this has been the case? If so, uh, have members indicated their willingness to increase that or reduce that? Otherwise, what is the point in changing the setup? Uh, and this Assembly needs to avoid another situation, Mr Deputy Speaker, in which Stormont uh, operated a slush fund for political parties. And I do not see how this proposal, coming from the bigger parties, would address the possibility of this happening uh, again. So I oppose the motion and I support the amendment. Thank you. I call Trevor Lunn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I'll stay straight off. I support this motion. I have a, a fair bit of sympathy with Mr. Allister's amendment, but I think the motion goes straight to the heart of the matter, frankly, whereas there seems to be some doubt about Mr. Allister's uh, amendment and its legality and also its enforceability. So I'll just talk about the motion. The, I, I, it's a, it's a no-brainer that we need an independent review panel to deal with our salaries and pensions. As, as chair of the pension trustees for many years, up until a few months ago, I had some dealings with, with the, the panel on the subject of uh, pensions, but naturally we ranged more broadly than that in those discussions. And I tell you, members, quite frankly, I, I, I agree with Mr. Wells completely. I might as well have spoken to the nearest oak tree and speak to that panel. They did not want to know about amendments, didn't want to know about the glaring, glaring inconsistencies in their determination on allowances. And there were actually one or two points which I won't dwell on to do with pensions, which they could have tidied up. So if we have a new panel established, and I hope we do, um, I hope they'll talk to us again about the pensions side of things, and I would have one or two suggestions for them. I would also suggest that if we're going to have an independent panel, it might not do any harm if there was a retired MLA advising them, with no axe to grind, a sitting MLA I'm not looking at myself because I haven't retired, but uh, who knows? But it has been suggested before, and I think it has merit. The, um, turning to the alliances, people have mentioned most of the things I wanted to raise, but I will say this: that the, the commission, if this goes ahead, will have a very valid template to work from. It's not all bad. It needs tidied. It needs inconsistencies dealt with in a way that the previous panel just, just refused point blank to listen to us about. The question of signage is much, much rehearsed. Well, apart from not being able to put your phone number, your email on a sign, you're also not allowed to have a protruding sign, which people can see more visibly when they're driving down the street. That's, that's apparently a mortal sin as well. And as for people who say it, you can, you can actually put your phone number on your window, apparently, and your email address. I'll tell you what, members, Mr. Speaker, if you had a bomb at your office, as I did, you probably wouldn't want to leave the shutter up so as people could see the phone number. And so it goes on. There's a question about mileage. Now, let me say straight away, I don't, I don't claim uh, home to Stormont mileage, because the last few years has been a, too complicated. But um, if I was a, a member, that's then a one of the more extended constituencies, let's take East Antrim perhaps, uh, and I lived in somewhere near Cushion Dunn, and I was getting the same mileage allowance as somebody who lives in Jordanstown. <laughs> I would find that ironic. So one of them was getting too much and one of them was getting too little. And pointing to something called a centroid in the middle of the constituency doesn't, doesn't solve the problem, but that's the way it is at the moment. The thing about constituency staff, 28 days holiday. Sure, yeah. I would also say that one of the obscenities, sorry, <laughs> sorry, one of the errors of the uh, 
determination is that we cannot pay staff travel allowance as they carry out their, their functions, for, for instance, for attending a planning appeal or a, a social security tribunal. We are for, for forbidden for claiming and paying them a small mileage rate for attendance of those events. Members, an extra minute. Thank you. That's one I hadn't thought of, Mr. Speaker, but I take the point. The, um, the question of the holidays, I mean, 28 days sounds like a, a reasonable average type of holiday allowance until you take off the 11 days statutory days, which had to be counted in that. So, in fact, they're only really getting seven, 17 days plus days when the office would be closed anyway. And this, is, this is not reasonable. It's not, it's not sensible. I would turn to the question of, of the pay scales. Pay scales are set in stone. Um, if, if a senior member of staff, again, if I was to retire, it would have to become redundant straight away and would have to be, if the next MLA moving into perhaps the same office with the same staff, once you've gone through a totally independent transparent selection procedure, of course, that, that person would have to take a £5,000 drop if they're at the top of the scale to retake their own job again. And if they didn't do it, you would lose all the experience that, that they have garnered. I, I, my own case, over 13 years with the same staff. So I could go on. The question of rent and rates, um, certainly we need a rent cap. But we don't need a rates cap alongside it. The, the, the differential across the country in this respect is stark. And if somebody can find an office at £8,500 a year in some areas of, of Belfast in particular and other big cities, good luck to them, because they will then hit the rates cap. I see Mr. Stalford nodding, it's a fact. So there are, there's plenty to be going on with here. I, I would encourage the Commission to take this forward. But I would also caution them that we are under scrutiny. Everybody is watching this. Everybody will watch what they do. And the, the, the things that need to be done here are not necessarily totally dramatic. They are, they are to tidy up wrongs and make this a better place for us to work and for... Uh, Member draws remarks to close. And for, particularly for constituency staff to work with some confidence in, in the, the way they're being treated. Support the motion, Mr Speaker. I now call on Jim Allister to wind on the amendment, and you have five minutes. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I must say I'm disappointed that in the course of this debate we have not had from the proponents of the motion any clarity on the key question. Are, we move, are they wanting us to move forward on this basis that we are going to amend the 2011 Act and bring legislation to do that and to do it above board and in order? Or are they wanting the Commission to supersede, a remarkable suggestion, to supersede the legislation and override and create a determination of their own. I do hope when we come to the wind, we'll have an indication of which course it is setting, because we both pointed for, uh, by the proposer of the motion. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I understand the temptation to hide behind making this all about staff. I have as many concerns as any other member of this House about the uh, foolishness of, me of the determination that was issued by the panel. But there's a fundamental question here, and it is, do we value, do we want to have independence governing the amount of our allowances, or do we want to take that to ourselves in the context that when this House last did that, it was grossly abused. And I do think there is a middle way. And I think the middle way is quite simple. That we, pursuant to the amendment, bring forward a bill to amend the 2011 Act to strengthen the powers of the Commission to give guidance, direction, to the panel on practical issues and about inequities that they create. But in a moment, I think that is the middle way to commit ourselves to legislation to do that, but to leave the setting of the quantum of the alliances exclusively with that panel. We seem to have got ourselves to a position where we had one bad panel, so to speak, 
So we never appointed another one to see could anything be done better. We never issued any directions under the 2011 Act. We were just happy to let it all fester. Well, I think to now create a situation where, in fact, we use the abuses of the panel of the past to simply supersede the panel, to take back to ourselves uh, and to obliterate the independence uh, is the wrong way to go. Uh, and I do say to the, the movers of this motion, why don't you take this motion back to the Commission without pushing it to a vote to consider the alternatives, to consider amending the 2011 Act, to give you, the Commission authority to intervene where that's right? Why don't you do that? If you do that, I'll not be pressing my amendment, but to try and to keep the Assembly in the dark about what you're really intending to do, and maybe next week issue a sudden finding which changes all of this, which I think is legally very questionable, given that you have the 2011 Act. But is that the intent? So I'm saying to the Assembly Commission, or those members of it who are pushing this, let's go for the middle way. Let's amend the 2011 Act to curb the excesses of the panel to give the Commission the status they should have and strengthen their ability to give some direction where it is necessary to do so. Uh, and I think if we did that, we would capture public confidence rather than squander public confidence, which is what this motion, unamended, undoubtedly will do. I'll give way to Mr. Wallace. First of all, we didn't have a poor panel, we had a dreadful panel. Uh, secondly, as Mr Lund quite rightly said, there were attempts made by both Commission members and individual MLAs to try and influence the decision made by the independent panel, and they totally ignored it. And if we go down the route that he suggested, exactly the same could happen again. The panel could say, we're independent, we have a right to make a decision, and frankly, we're going to ignore what you say. That, members, next minute. That, of course, is why I suggested that we need to amend the 2011 Act to give the, com the Commission the status to indicate guidance to the panel. The pro problem is that we've had a panel who did many very foolish things, but the Commission never seems to have challenged them under the terms of 2-4. Uh, but now we're, now we're in a situation where the motion is saying, get rid of all the independents. All of the independents. That's the essence of it. Any independent scrutiny and or s surveillance of expenses, take it away. Give all of that to the MLAs through the Commission. Let's go back to where we were. And I'm simply cautioning this House to go back to where you were is a dark place. It's a dark place open to abuse. It's a dark place open to scandal. I don't want to see the this house, remarks to close? whatever else I think about it, go to that place. That's why I'm offering an amendment which I think steers a middle way and projects a route whereby we can make the changes but make them with, uh, with attaining public confidence. I now call on John O'Dowd to wind up the debate on the motion and you'll have up to 10 minutes. Uh, uh, I thank all the members who have contributed to today's debate and I will try to cover the points made on the questions posed by members. I, I, I suspect that the best way to sum up today's debate is this. Uh, success is many fathers and failure is an orphan. But let me be clear that success in this case is about rectifying the wrong of the past. And all the Commission parties have debated this at length over many, many years, more intensely since the Assembly resumed because all the parties around the table wanted to rectify the wrong. Now, there may be different versions of what happened at Commission meetings and different opinions of what happened at Commission meetings, but no one, and I mean no one, can deny the fact that there is a motion before this House today signed by all the parties on the Commission. Now, so what was right on Friday has to be right on Tuesday. Very well. 
I appreciate the member not wanting to get into much about what was discussions, but I am sincerely baffled at the claim by the Alliance Party that there was a vote that was voted down by the other four parties. That did not happen. Is that your recollection? Well, I, I don't want to get into Commission meetings, uh, but I have no recollection of a vote. Um, I certainly have evidence in front of me of a motion before the House. But, members, the, the, you've already been informed why the amendment is competent. It is unworkable. So those who want to uh, back the amendment, and you're perfectly entitled to do so, cannot back the amendment with the view that it is going to bring a resolution to all the issues that have been expressed across the chamber this morning and have been expressed by many members over many years. It will not resolve the issue. The fact is that when you go back to your constituency offices and when you meet your constituency office manager and your other members of staff, you will have to look them in the eye and tell them that you had the opportunity to right the wrong and you didn't if you back Mr Allister's amendment. Because it will not solve the issues of workers' terms and conditions or pay. So when you go back to your constituency offices, and some of your staff may be sitting in offices uh, in this building, go back to them, sit down in front of them, and look them in the eye and say, I had the opportunity to correct the wrong, but I backed an amendment in the full knowledge that that amendment will fail. I'm, I'm sorry, I have, I have a number of things. I may give way later on in the debate. This idea that there is a middle way is a myth. There is always alternatives, but the question you have to ask yourself, what is, what is workable? What do we need to do now to ensure that the terms, conditions and pay of our staff is rectified? What you need to do now is back the Commission's amendment or the Commission's motion. If you want to prolong this, back the amendment. If you want to move towards the 2011 bill, yes, that can be done. It will take about a year. Uh, it will take significant discussions. And given the experience of I as a Commission member in this motion, am I seriously now to believe that if I was to negotiate a bill with other Commission members, that that bill would get through the floor of this House? I would have serious doubts, given my experience over this last 72 hours. So, folks, the choice is simple. You either act now or you delay. That's the choice. There's no middle way. In terms of accountability, and quite rightly, members of the public and some commentators will want accountability on this, and they should. Mistakes were made in the past. Things should have been done better in the past. But there are things within the, the IFRP report which we should continue with. The accountability mechanisms on it, many of the accountability mechanisms should be still there and should be ret retained in any fresh Commission determination. It will not be the Commission which will be managing MLA's allowances and claims. It will be the finance branch of the Assembly. The same body that does it now will be managing the, the claims and the expenses of MLA's. It will not be the Commission members. So if members are satisfied that the finance committee or the finance body here, who had a very difficult task, I have to say, and I'm sure have faced challenge from many members over the previous determination, but we have to say one thing. They stuck rigidly by the rules. And I am confident that they will stick rigidly by the rules going forward. So it will not be the Commission managing the affairs of members. It will be the finance branch of this Assembly. Uh, some members have suggested this is a, an unusual setup that MLA is setting their own alliances. The fact is, it happens in Scotland. Is Mr. Uh, Carl suggesting that the Scottish model is unfair, that the Scottish model does not have accountability, that the Scottish model is being abused by Scottish MSPs? I, I have no account of it. Perhaps if he has an example of it, I'd, I'd like to hear it. But the Scottish model is what we are following. We follow the Scottish model and many other things. It seems to be the end thing to do. So there is accountability at the heart of this. Uh, members have also expressed, and quite rightly, have said the public are angry about this. Well, maybe they're not right, because I don't know if the public are angry about this. I know some commentators are angry about it. But some of those commentators have something in common with us. They're paid from the public purse. But that's where it ends. 
Because I don't know how much they're paid. I don't know how much expenses claims they have. I don't know anything about it. But quite rightly, MLAs are held to a higher standard. And over this last number of years, we have uh, learned lots of lessons from the mistakes of the past and also the opportunities, and those should continue moving forward. Um, I've already expressed my disappointment at those parties who have signed up to the motion now backtracking from it. Um, it's up to them to explain. But uh, Ms Armstrong talked today is uh, International Parliamentarians Day. Or, right. What confidence does it give to the general public when the Commission of the Assembly agrees a motion on Friday and then walks away from it on Tuesday? The, the one thing the public aren't is stupid. The public will see through all those things in terms of whether political parties have genuine, I will in one moment, have genuine concerns about the interests of the public or are they reacting to the latest commentary show or radio show or TV show or article, whatever it may be. The public, and Mr Alistair referred to, the public won't forget the past, and nor they should, but the public will not be fooled either. They're not foolish people. They, they will take and they will examine these matters. The, 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 the public who come into our constituency offices on a daily basis are phone us around. Those people appreciate the work we do for them. But nine times out of ten, the first people they make contact with are the people who sit in our constituency offices, our staff. Those staff have to deal with some very, very harrowing cases. We all can recount. Uh, people come to us sometimes when they're very lowest. Those staff are paid low wages, terrible terms and conditions, and listen to casework which goes home with them at the end of the day. When you pop, just go ahead. Thank the member for giving way. Um, it's just a, does he, is he aware that a, a person's grade three member of staff will take 19 years, 19 years to reach the top of their pay scale? Yes, and some of those who are criticising for us doing this would not work for those terms or conditions. No, certainly not. So we owe it to the staff. I am shocked at Mr. Carroll. People before profit. The clues in the no won't. The clues in the title. People before profit. And Mr. Carroll is going to go back to his office today and sit in front of his member of staff and say, I had the opportunity to bring your terms and conditions up to the other staff who work in this building, and I didn't. Now, how can he stand on picket lines and support? No, won't. You've had your chance. How can he stand on picket lines for public sector workers and demand proper terms and conditions when he's the opportunity to do it today for female workers in particular who are terribly discriminated against in this, in this uh, institution? How can you stand on a picket line and say, I order, order, order. I would ask for remarks to be addressed through the chair. Thank you. How can he stand on a picket line and tell him that he stands up for workers' pay? He has an opportunity today as an employer. He is the employer, as is everyone else in this room, as an employer to go through the lobbies and vote to improve terms and conditions for staff. And I also, this is, I'm closing this. I'm happy as a Commission member, as part of the terms and conditions of the next determination, for those members who want to be set by an independent body to have the ability to sign out of it. They can wait on the independent body. But I, and I the member draws remarks to close. are determined to right the wrong now. <coughs> Members, the question is that, that the amendment standing in the name of Jim Allister be made. All in those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. Aye. All in that. Do we have tellers? Sorry, I had a miss. I'll clear the lobbies. The question will be put again in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come into the chamber. So the question will be put again in three minutes. <coughs> Order members, would members resume their seat?
Members, the question is that the amendment standing in the name of Jim Allister be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. No. Aye. no. Do we have tellers? Order members, members resume their seats. The following tellers have been appointed. Tellers for the eyes, Jim Allister and Doug Beattie. Tellers for the nose, Colm East, or Gildenew and Paul Gibbon. Before the assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per standing order 112, the assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. It is important that during any division that social distancing in the chamber continues to be observed. In order to facilitate this, I would ask the following. Any member in the chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the chamber until the, the division it has concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies on the opposite side of the chamber to which they are currently sitting should leave the chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby doors should enter the lobbies first. Any member who has voted may then wish to leave the chamber until the division has concluded. How any member who needs to vote in both lobbies should not leave the chamber. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times, to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks and to respect the needs for social distancing. Clear the lobbies, the house will divide, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order members, would members resume their seat? Clark, please read the result. 87 members voted, 20 members voted aye, 67 members voted no. One member who voted in both lobbies is not included in these results. The amendment therefore falls. The amendment falls, the amendment falls. Unfasten the doors. And I wish to pause for a few moments to allow any member who may have left the chamber to, to return. Okay. Members, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Uh, I would just ask members to take their ease for a few moments as we change staff at the table. <laughs>